Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, uh, it's my pleasure today to have uh, two visitors, uh, both of whom are faculty members at the University of Illinois at <coughs> Champaign-Urbana and are part of the UPCRC project there. Um, and they're going to be giving a tag team lecture on time travel, which is obviously a subject of great interest to all of us, particularly those of us getting older. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so let, let me introduce... Uh, uh, <laughs> Professor uh, uh, Joseph Torellis and Sam King, and I think uh, Joseph is going to go first. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, everybody, for, for coming to the lecture. I, I appreciate your attendance. So Sam and I are part of the UPCRC Center at Illinois, and we thought it would be perhaps interesting for us to stop by and give you kind of an overview of some of the work that we are doing in trying to understand the time travel in multiprocessors. Okay, so feel free to stop me and stop us anytime during the talk. I'm just going to go and give a brief, uh, say, a third of the, of the talk, and then Sam will take over. So the motivation, of course, is that we're moving to multiprocessors. Um, the number, of course, per processor will continue to grow. And the major issue is programmability. Programmability should become a top priority, arguably, as important as high performance of, or power efficiency. And what we need, or at least what we are doing, is trying to figure out good primitives that can help programmability. And one such primitive is time travel. What is time travel? Time travel is the ability to visit and recreate past states and events in the computer. Why do we want this? We can do this for debugging a program. So ideally, we would want to know how we got to this point, what brought us to this bug. But there are other applications of this. One of them is security. It will tell us how we got attacked, what, what, uh, how did the attacker get into the system. Right? Another one is fault tolerance. This thing doesn't seem to work. Fault tolerance, for example, you can have two machines, one of them executing and sending a trace of what it's doing to another one, and then this other machine is kind of a backup. If the first one disappears or dies, the second can continue. How do we accomplish this? One technology is the deterministic replay of execution. And that's what we're going to focus here. So how does the deterministic replay work? How does it work? It, work in two it works in two steps. First, you have the initial execution, also called recording. And the idea here, here is that you execute, and then you try to record any non-deterministic events in a log. Right? And this could be, say, the memory access interleaving, if you have a multi-threaded program, or the set of interrupts, when they occurred and, and their time. And then what you do in, in a second step, you replay the program. And what you do is you go back to a previous checkpoint, and then you use the log to force the software down to the same path. Okay? So that's the idea of deterministic replay. There's been a lot of work on software support for deterministic replay, you know, some, of, some of the work done here. It can be done at the compiler level, virtual machine, operating system, many levels. Right? We know it's very nice, it works, it's flexible, it integrates well with the rest of the software stack. The problem is that it doesn't work so well for multiprocessors. Okay? At least that's what we think. And the reason is that it would be too slow to do it in a multiprocessor because we would need to record the interleaving of all the shared memory accesses to know exactly how this program interleaved, the memory accesses interleaved. So you would need to instrument all these things. So this is an opportunity for the hardware, and that's the motivation for hardware-based deterministic replay systems. The idea here is that the hardware can record the ordering of shared memory accesses efficiently okay, with some extra support. The way it works is the proposals, there's no existing hardware yet, but the proposals are as follows. Suppose you have two threads here. One of them at instruction N1 writes to location A, 
And then later on, at instruction M1, this one here reads location A. So then I need to log, as I execute this, an event that says, when I get to instruction M1, I need to make sure to check P1 to make sure that P1 has already passed N1. Okay, so that's the idea. The log will have, in the, most simple, in the simplest case, an entry for each arrow that when I replay, I will read and make sure that when I get to M1, I wait for P1 to execute first. And that's going to enforce the same interleaving. This seems appealing. However, there are a bunch of problems. First is that you would need to have a lot of a large log because you may need an entry for each arrow or group of arrows. Okay. The second thing is that the replay occurs using sequential consistency. We're going to have threads going on and pick an instruction from each thread right, and replay them assuming that each instruction occurred atomically. In reality, processors have reordered this thing, and things may not follow sequential consistency. So that's another problem with existing systems. And finally, perhaps the most important, is that people who have looked at this have focused mostly on this hardware primitive without caring about how do you integrate this into an operating system. Okay? And that's the subject of our work. So what we're going to do here is try to figure out how one would build a system that works, we think. Very briefly, I'm going to present our des hardware design called DeLorean, which appeared in ISCA 2008. This is a very efficient way of recording and replay. The bulk of the talk, however, will be on a new software hardware interface for replay. Okay? This appeared in ASPLOS a month ago. And the idea is, how do you design an operating system to make hardware-based replay systems useful. So what's DeLorean? DeLorean is the motivation for this work. It's a hardware-based MP replay scheme that uses chunk-based execution. Okay? The highlights is that the highlights are that it requires very, very small log, less than 1% of currently proposed hardware systems. It replays at very high speed. This could be particularly important for the fault-tolerant environment. And then it has an, a knob that allows us to trade off speed versus logging requirements, depending on what stage in your debugging process you may want to use one or the other systems, uh, knobs, uh, values of the knobs. To explain DeLorean, first I need to explain what I mean by chunk-based execution. So here we are looking at a system where processors execute chunks of instructions at a time. These are consecutive dynamic instructions that we call chunks, a bunch of loads and stores. Right? And these chunks, the machine supports atomically. So they are executed in a way that any, si any side effects are not visible until the chunk commits. Think about a transaction. Okay? So imagine a machine that works on transactions all the time. So whenever I commit a chunk, only then I make the state visible of this chunk to the, rest of the, to the rest of the world. And same thing here. Moreover, these chunks execute in isolation, like transactions, which means that if I have this chunk here having read that has read location x, and then this chunk here executes and writes location x and then commits, this one has to be squashed and restarted because it has seen old, an old value. Okay? So we will squash this thing and restart. If we use this model, the system appears logically to execute in a total order of chunks. Right? There is a chunk from processor 1, one from processor 4, one from processor 0 in some order. Okay? So that's, this is the model. And this is interesting because memory access interleaving happens only at chunk boundaries. Okay? So imagine we have a machine that supports transactions all the time. And in this case, I'm going to assume that they are invisible to the software. Okay? The interesting thing here is that inside the chunk, memory accesses can be reordered and overlapped in any way I want, because they won't be visible. And examples of systems that use this is TCC, transactional memory and memory 
Consistency and Coherence by, from Stanford and Balcassi from Illinois. So what's the advantage of, what is the implication of chunk-based execution on deterministic replay? If we use this model, now the deterministic replay becomes very simple. All we need to do is to generate the same chunks during replay as in the initial execution, the same chunks, right? And commit them in the same order. That's all. So if we have this initial execution where we had these chunks and this order of commit, that's all I need to remember. I don't need to have the same exact timing between these two chunks. As long as they commit in the same order, that's enough. Also, I don't need to follow the same instruction, the same order of instructions within a chunk. They can execute in any order. What matters is that at the end, the chunk stops at the same point and it commits in the same order. How do you change chunk boundaries? How do you choose chunk boundaries? So you would want to use them deterministically. For example, every n number of committed instructions would be a good, a good design point. n being 1,000, 2,000 or so. So the result of this, two major implications. One, the log is very small. Second, I can have very high speed replay. Okay. Why the log is very small? because I don't need to store arrows, I don't need to store dependencies. All I need to store is the order of chunk commits, right, in this transactional-based approach. Therefore, the log is simply the total order of chunk commits and their size. Okay? So I'm going to have each entry will be very short, processor ID, and the number of instructions or the number of loads and stores, however I want to measure the size of a chunk. That's deterministic. Why do you need to track chunks? Okay, so this would be the naive, the, more, the naive case would be it's not deterministic. I would need to store the size, right? The log, however, will be updated very infrequently because it would be only every 2,000 instructions or whatever. This is the log. Processor ID, size. Processor ID, size. Processor ID, size. Hmm? If, if there is synchronization inside one of those deterministic let's say constant boundaries, I mean, then it's still deterministic, but it would have to adapt to that because you need to, I mean, for example, if I want to release some other computation, I need to get my chunk. Well, you don't have to. You, you can continue, right? Yeah. All, that gonna, all that's going to do is delay the time when the other guy can acquire the log. Yeah, so if I ever release a quire pair, though. Um, Inside? Yeah. Well, so if you can acquire that guy, fine. Otherwise, you may have to spin. Right? And if you spin, if you cannot acquire the log, that counts as instruction. So eventually you'll cut the chunk. These are not static chunks, they are dynamic. Therefore, you don't have this deadlock that you could have. Anyway, so the idea then would be, in this case, would be to have a set of processors. I'm going to have a hard, an arbitrary module here in hardware. This is kind of irrelevant. You could have a bus or whatever. The memory log is implemented as two different structures. The processor interleaving log, the one that has the PIDs, processor IDs, and then the chunk size log, which I'm going to distribute across the machine. So then, the chunk size log will be in each processor, and the arbiter will centralize the processor ID log. So whenever a processor zero, for example, finishes a chunk, then it will send a request to commit to the arbiter, Perhaps processor one will also send a request to commit. And then the arbiter will select one of them, say, OK, you're committed using a certain algorithm. This one will store the size here. And this one will store the processor ID. And then perhaps concurrently, this one will request or will say that you're also committed. Then this one will store the size and the processor ID. So kind of the idea here is that this doesn't, this log doesn't have to be centralized, it can be distributed. The combination of the processor ID history and the chunk size history is the log of the program. Now, how do we reduce the size of the log? Very simple. So, suppose I have two threads only. This is the history of the processor ID that commit. This is the history of the chunk size. First thing I can do is use large chunks. The larger I use, the larger the chunks, the shorter the log, right? So you say close to 2,000 instructions. So this gets shorter. 
Second thing I do is use fixed size chunking, or rather deterministic chunking. You know, if I have, for example, a page fault or whatever that requires me to stop the chunk, right? as long as this thing is deterministic, I don't need to log the chunk size. Okay? So I'm going to have 2,000 and just remove this thing, making the chunk size deterministic. Third thing I can do is predefine the interleaving. So rather than having the arbiter take the chunks and record the order in which they came, let's say I have a round robin algorithm that says I'm going to take one chunk from each processor. Right? And if somebody comes and says I want to commit and it's not his turn, I'm going to say just wait. So then if I have 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, I can get rid of this. So in a sense, I'm eliminating most, most of the logging. Of course, there are trade-offs in all cases. If I use large chunks, you have fewer entries per log. But I may have more collisions. The longer the chunks, more collisions, more overflows, and so forth. If I have deterministic chunking, then I can remove the CS log that used to keep the size of the log. But I may have non-deterministic events, such as cache overflows, where I need to cut the chunk. So then I'm going to have small CS log that keeps only those chunks, the size of those chunks that were cut non-deterministically. Okay, so there are some events that I need to log still. And if I use predefined interleaving, I don't need to have a PI log. But I may have some performance degradation because I fix the order of commits and I may have load imbalance, and, and, but maybe OK. All right, so to summarize then, there are multiple, there is basically a dial that says I can either use the nano or the pico log. Both cases are large chunks. Both cases use deterministic chunking, so very tiny log. And this one uses no PI log, predefined interleaving. So that's perhaps what you want to do is when you initially debug a program, you want to use this one here that has very, very little logging, but may have some kind of uh, slow down. But this one here, you know, you may want to focus on, on this particular bug later. Now, the other advantage I said is that this is a high-speed replay system. And the reason is that processors, as they replay, you don't need any special support as you replay. You don't need, basically what you do is processors still execute in parallel normally. All they do is they check their CS log to see when they have a chunk that is special and they need to cut it. Otherwise, they continue executing regularly, performing this deterministic chunking. And then the arbiter simply uses the PI log that it has from the initial execution to decide at, in which order it can pick the chunk commits. Okay? So this can be, say, if you have a replay machine that uses this approach, it can execute approximately at the same speed or comparable speed as the initial machine. Okay. Are there any guarantees or unusual choices you have to make so that you're guaranteed during replay to generate a chunk that you always succeed the same length as the originally logged chunk? So I ran a thousand instructions the first time in the chunk. Now I'm trying to rerun it. Um, I have to be able to get through a thousand instructions without cache overflow or whatever. Does that just follow? From, well. Caches and branch predictors, the state may be different during execution and replay. So you may have events, for example, a cache overflow that you didn't have in the original case. Okay? In that case, you need to stop the chunk now, but you tell the arbiter, wait, don't commit anything else. Let me finish what I need to do. Okay. Right? So does that turn my replay chunk into two chunks? It could be, yes. Right? But it has That's to be. Right, I'm still holding yes. off everybody. It has to be deterministic. OK, but the other advantage is this high replay speed. We're not interpreting, if you want, the log as, as the other schemes. But instead, we are using it uh, to basically prove that we are in following the same path. OK, so I have an evaluation of this thing, which I'm going to skip in the interest of time. Only thing I want to say is that in this model of execution, the logs can become very, very small. You know, we get to a point where you could have, say, a machine that runs for a whole day, a whole day, and be able to have very few gigabytes per core. 
right? So you have an eight processor machine, you would have perhaps about 20 gigabytes in one day. And that would allow you to, in this nano and this pico mode, to re-execute the code again. Okay? Anyway, so this is the, the hardware aspect of the talk. Um, Sam will continue and, and, and look at the second issue, which is how to make this usable. Okay, thanks, Joseph. So uh, in the first part of our talk, Joseph showed you a very uh, interesting hardware level mechanism that lets you record the, the state of an entire computer system very efficiently. So what I'm going to talk about today is how we can take this mechanism and include it into an overall software system. So can we take this hardware and integrate it into an operating system to make it much more practical? Now, one of the problems with current hardware-based replay schemes is that they're, they're largely impractical. So there are three key problems with, with the current proposals. So first, there's not really a notion of um, separating software that's being recorded from software that's not. So in the typical hardware-based scheme, they'll view the state as the entire computer system. And they'll record absolutely everything that's running on the system, which you know, people have shown can, can be made uh, effective. But the problem is, as Joseph showed, we're storing gigabytes of, of data a day. So how do you store these gigabytes of data? Well, you'd write it out to disk. And, and you know, this is where a little bit of software could help out. But now that software is part of your state that's being replayed. So what happens when you replay something that's logging? You know, it, it ends up being a, a very difficult situation to, to try to solve. Um, second is many of the hardware-based replay schemes require either a specialized VMM or a simulator or a completely separate machine. But if you look at many of the common uses for replay, such as debugging, you know, this type of configuration doesn't make sense. So if you, you, you've got a student and they're trying to debug their program uh, and you ask them to use two separate computers, it's just not going to work. And finally, and, and perhaps most importantly, you can't mix normal execution with recorded and replayed execution on the same set of hardware at the same time. So what this means is if on your computer you want to listen to an MP3 while you're programming, uh, it's not going to work. So what we wanted to do is see if we could address these shortcomings. But fundamentally, in order to do this, we have to redesign the hardware mechanisms that, that we use for doing replay, and we have to integrate it into a real operating system and a real software system. So what I'll be talking about today is CAPO. And this is our, our practical hardware-assisted deterministic replay system. So really what CAPO is, is it's a hardware software interface for, for allowing software to access underlying replay hardware. Um, now, as one part of, of this key of the of the CAPO interface is this key abstraction called a replay sphere. So a replay sphere is our way of reasoning about chunks of software that are being recorded or replayed. And so what the replay sphere does is it allows us to isolate different entities on the same computer. So you've got three different replay spheres. One of them might be recording, another one might be replaying. Um, and the replay sphere abstraction helps us do that. Second, it gives us a very clean way to divide the responsibilities of the hardware and the software. Things inside the sphere, hardware needs to take care of. Things outside of the sphere are the software's responsibility. Now, using uh, this, this, these abstractions and this hardware software interface, we built a system called CAPO1, which is the first implementation of this interface. And to me, one of the really interesting aspects about this project is, you know, Joseph and I together, we have a lot of experience with deterministic replay. We've been looking at this for a number of years now. Um, you know, he from the hardware side and me from the software side. But one of the interesting things we found is this isn't just a matter of taking a hardware scheme and a software scheme and, and combining them together, because there are very subtle and very fundamental interactions when you combine these types of systems together. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So overall, for, for my section of the talk, I'll describe uh, the internals of CAPO, including our replay spheres and our, and our hardware software interface. Um, and then I'll talk about some of these fundamental interactions between the two and include uh, our evaluation. Now, in addition, at the end, I've reserved a little bit of time to talk about a few other research projects that, that my, my group is working on, some of which are, are uh, associated with the UPCRC. Is there a question, James? Uh, yes. 
beginning of uh, the whole talk, there's this idea that maybe we could use some of this replay stuff for security and you know, figure out why we're being so. So at any point, are you going to talk about how, you know, what your threat model is for the underlying replay hardware? You know, how an attacker might try to elude detection. So I think that this really boils down to a software problem. So you know, this is it's, it's kind of similar to a threat model of of a processor, right? So you know, we're assuming that we've got a, a replay system implemented inside an operating system. If an attacker breaks into our operating system, then we're not going to be able to record things deterministically. So the hardware doesn't necessarily work into the threat model. I think it's still the traditional threat model we would have. Um, it's just a very useful tool for making what the software would do much more efficient. So the first topic I'm going to discuss today are the, are the replay spheres. And the first thing I'm going to talk about are how we can use replay spheres to isolate processes. So shown here on this figure, we've got a, a four CPU system with some replay hardware and an operating system running up above. Um, now, we have our first process, which is a blue process that includes two different threads that are running on CPUs one and three. We've also got a second process, which is our gray process running on, uh, that has a thread running on CPU 2, and then finally a, a, a third process here running on CPU 4. So now what we want to do is we want to take these, these processes and we want to record them and replay them as their own unit. Um, so one of the, the early distinctions we made is that we're only going to record user mode threads. So the hardware is only responsible for things that are happening up here inside user mode. When the system transitions to supervisor mode and into the operating system, the replay hardware stops recording dependencies. And so what this allows us to do is it allows us to exclude the operating system from our replay sphere, and it gives us much more flexibility so that our operating system can have uh, non-determinism. Things running inside user mode have to be deterministic, but we have much more flexibility with the operating system because of this distinction. Now, if we want to uh, record and replay processes, we've got um, shown here replay sphere one, where we're encompassing two different threads in, in, um, from the one process together. And then we've got another replay sphere on the, on the right, where we have another thread that's being encompassed. Yeah, Ed? So is there anything you have to worry about when you're excluding the operating system about the uh, dependent data coming out of system calls? So I have two threads entering the kernel and they're writing to a FIFO or reading or writing from a pipe and, and that interaction is clearly deterministic and you have to somehow force that. Uh, I'm assuming, well, I guess I'll let you get to replay it. But yeah, so, so if you're talking about outputs from system calls, you really only have to worry about that if you're re-executing the system calls and using the results. So when we're replaying nominally, we just throw the results away, and it doesn't matter. Um, but there's an optimization that you can do where you can, you can add another process inside the replay sphere and then use the outputs from one system call to feed into the other. So it's a, it's a way of optimizing. That's when you have to start worrying about these types of issues. Yeah? What about input? Um, inputs we have to record. So I'll spend a lot of time talking about that. So one of the key... Um, key ways that we, that, we, uh, that we go away from the hardware-based schemes are this notion of an R thread. So for the previous hardware-based approaches, everything was processor-based. You had processor 1 committing a chunk, processor 2 committing a chunk. But we wanted to express a slightly higher level of abstraction to the hardware. And so that's why we use an R thread. An R thread um, is analogous to a software thread but what this allows us to do is express this software level thread to the replay hardware directly. So this enables us to take um, a, a thread and, and replay it among multiple different processors and gives us a, this extra layer of indirection gives us much more flexibility. Now, one of the requirements of our replay spheres are that any R threads that share memory have to run inside the same replay sphere. Now, as I mentioned when I was answering Ed's question, there are some, some optimizations that are possible. So you could also include additional processes within your same replay sphere. And this would mean that these two processes are recorded and replayed as a unit. And there are some opportunities to optimize uh, log space. Now, 
I guess it's deterministic. So um, we have a uh, uh, software component that manages all of the, this entire system. So um, you can't really read this, but it's called our replace sphere manager or an RSM. So in many ways, our replace sphere manager uh, is like a traditional operating system where it's going to manage our resources below and it's going to provide abstractions for everything running up above. Now, one thing that, um, that, that I, I haven't really talked about explicitly is, you know, in what type of system does this work? So for this talk, I'm going to focus on an operating system that records and replays processes. But the concepts we've, we found here, we believe translate to any type of layered system where you have a lower layer that's recording and replaying something running up above. So we believe that, that you could fit these techniques into something like a virtual machine monitor and use it to record and replay virtual machines. But um, you know, for, for, for this talk, I'll refer to an operating system recording and replaying processes. So when, in order to, to separate responsibilities, the replay sphere um, provides a, a, a barrier between hardware and software. And so what it does is it says, you know, anything within the replay sphere is the hardware's responsibility. So this means that all of the R threads that are running within a replay sphere, they have to, um, they have, to have the exact same interleaving. And so the hardware is responsible for recording this and what we call an interleaving log. Now when we go to replay, the hardware is responsible for enforcing this exact same interleaving um, within the sphere itself. Now, things that are outside of the replay sphere are the software's responsibility. So these are any types of non-determinism that could affect your process um, have to be recorded by the RSM, the software level RSM, so that can be re-injected during replay. So some examples of, of things that we record are system calls, signals, the, the RDTSC instruction, and any other source of non-determinism that could potentially affect the process, we have to record in our, in our sphere input log and then later re-inject this into the sphere as it's replaying. Yeah, Ed? Are you tracking the RDTSC? Are you recording the instruction? That's right. So RDTSC and CPU ID, we, are, uh, we, we set up the processor so that it'll trap when it's executed from user mode and we emulate. Um, we found that most of the software that executes RDTSC is the operating system. There's this little thing in CRT0 that we still don't understand that seems to call it, but it's just once at the beginning. So, you know, from a performance perspective, we, we didn't have any trouble with it. But yeah, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. So, the, we don't handle it explicitly in this particular project, mainly because we didn't have to. So it's very rare for a process to, to do memory mapped IO or DMA, but I think the key insight is that if a process were to do these things, it would have to go through the operating system. And because it would have to go through the operating system, we can record it. So memory mapped I.O., we can do just like we do with RDTSC, where we trap and emulate, and, and other people have done that before. DMA takes a little bit more work, where what you can do is create a separate buffer and do the DMA into that buffer and then copy that. And so, you know, th there's some overhead associated with it, but, but these are things that, that still fit within our conceptual model. So overall, the hardware level log and the software level log create our total replay log. So in addition to separating responsibilities, our RSM is also responsible to make sure that any threads that share memory have to run within the same replay sphere. So this is something that software has to guarantee. If you have a thread that's sharing memory that's not within a replay sphere, you're not going to be able to deterministically replay those processes. Um, for the most part, our operating system is allowed to be non-deterministic, but the RSM has to do a little bit of work to make sure a few key functions of the OS are deterministic. And uh, specifically, these are, these are around virtual me memory and uh, process creation and R thread ID allocation. And I'm going to talk about that particular point in more detail later. Um, in, in addition, the RSM has to manage these different input logs. So when you're recording it, it stores them in a file and then it spits it back at the, the hardware and software during replay. And then finally it has to, to manage the underlying hardware. So Capo's hardware interface, um, we designed this interface to be independent of the underlying re replay hardware we're using. So our hope 
is that the, the hardware software interface and the abstractions we've developed would work regardless of what you have running underneath. Now, the hardware we have running underneath is DeLorean for, for obvious reasons, but um, our hope is that we came up with an independent uh, hardware software interface. Now, in order to handle logs, we use a traditional interrupt-driven buffering system, just kind of like you'd see with a network card. And um, we've introduced two different data structures that are shared between the software and the hardware. And these data structures make up the state of our replay system. So we have a per-processor rthread control block. And what this does is it allows us to specify to each individual processor which rthread and which replay sphere are currently uh, running on that particular processor. Um, now, we also have a per sphere replay sphere control block, which allows us to tell the hardware if a particular sphere is recording or replaying. Now, as I mentioned before, one of the jobs of our replay hardware, uh, of, our, of our RSM, is to virtualize this replay hardware. Now, in, in many respects, this is similar to what an operating system does with processes. So, if you have a process that's running, it thinks that it has its own copy of the underlying processor. Now, we all know that you know, the operating system is multiplexing things, but it's this illusion of infinite amounts of, of processors that the operating system provides that we're trying to copy here, where we provide the illusion of infinite amounts of replay hardware. So what that can mean is if we have the software level replay sphere manager and two different uh, hardware replay spheres beneath, we could have one sphere that's running, currently occupying one of our replay uh, sphere control blocks. And as it's, as it's running, it's being recorded. And the RSM will take the logs from software and hardware and, and store it into an overall replay log. Now we can also have a second sphere that's replaying that can then read data back in from the log and um, inject it into the hardware and inject it into the replay sphere at the appropriate times. We could also have a third sphere that's ready to run and, and um, is going to record, but there's not enough hardware available. So we put it in a queue just like you would with a traditional OS scheduler. Now, one of the really interesting parts about this project were these three key challenges that we found when, when combining these, this type of hardware and software system. So the first part, the first challenge is when you copy data into a sphere, you have to be careful to make sure that there's a deterministic interleaving. Second, when you're handling system calls, there are certain, most of the system calls you get to emulate, um, others you have to re-execute and you have to make sure that there's enough determinism so that it can be useful to the hardware. And then finally, when we have fewer processors available during replay than we had during recording, uh, the software has to handle that. So the first challenge I mentioned was copying data into a sphere. So in this particular figure, we have an operating system with a replay sphere that has two different threads inside the replay sphere. And these threads have a, a shared buffer called buff. So what happens is our thread one might issue a read system call, which will be handled by the operating system. The operating system will, will grab the appropriate data, and it'll use a function such as copy to user to copy data into the process. Now, before the actual copy takes place, the RSM will make a copy of the data that's about to be um, loaded into the process, and then we'll go ahead and carry out the, pro the, the copy operation, changing the data. Now the problem is, what happens if R thread 2 accesses this buffer at the same time? Now remember, things inside the replay sphere aren't a problem, because the hardware is going to make sure that, that we have uh, deterministic interleaving. But now, we have the operating system that's, that's making this type of change. And as I mentioned, the operating system is not part of the, the, the hardware. So now we have a source of non-determinism that we have to handle. So there are many different ways we could have solved this problem. But what we, well, the solution we, we came up with is to include the copy to user function within the replay sphere. Okay? So this is a very elegant solution because the underlying hardware is already pretty good at recording these types of interleaving. So we use it. Now, some of the trade-offs that we make are that um, now our copy to user function has to be deterministic. So we have to guarantee that when this copy happens, it's going to execute the exact same instruction, instructions given a set of inputs. Um, in practice, we didn't find that to be too difficult, but it is one of the requirements. Um, another, re another 
another more stylistic issue is that now we've slightly blurred the boundary between what's a replay sphere and what's not. You know, before we had this very clean, elegant notion where only user mode code is. Um, now we've got a little bit of the kernel that's being included as part of our replay sphere. And there aren't any problems with this necessarily, but it's just more of a stylistic thing. You know, it's one of the trade-offs that, 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 that we felt we had to make. So uh, another issue that came up was this idea about emulating versus re-executing system calls when we replay. Now, during replay, the, the RSM emulates most system calls. So that means when the system call is issued, instead of uh, passing it to the operating system, the RSM will just return whatever was returned previously. Um, but we do have a number of system calls that we have to re-execute. And the reason we re-execute these are for efficiency. So, you know, the one class of functions that we re-execute are thread management functions. So, you know, we, we, we want to have something that's going to integrate cleanly with the OS scheduler, and the best way to do that is to create a thread. So we, we re-execute uh, thread management calls. Another example are address space modification calls. So certainly, we could emulate loads and stores if we wanted to, or we could rely on the underlying hardware to do this for us. And in order to do that, we have to re-execute some of our uh, address space modification calls. So to, to make this a little bit more clear, I've got a, uh, a, a quick example of both emulating and re-executing system calls. I'm trying to figure out what RSM. Yeah, why, are we, why we only see the bottom third of RSM. Well, yeah, I. It's all right. No, carry on. Fortunately, you guys have good enough imagination that you're able to fill it in for us. But um, so shown here on this on this figure, we've got the operating system below, and this white chunk is the RSM. Um, we also have a re replay sphere running up here above, and, and two different R threads. And one of the system calls that we emulate is the read system call. So if thread one were to execute the read system call, it traps down to the RSM, which will then um, grab data from a log and then re-inject this data back into the process. So it doesn't ever pass control to the operating system. It's just emulating what happened before. Um, a second class of, and, and so you know, this, this type of emulation is, is a pretty classic technique that, that other people have used with, with many replay systems. Um, now where things get a little bit more interesting are where we have to re-execute system calls. And so let's say that thread two issues a fork system call. Now, what we do is the RSM will trap, and it'll pass control to the operating system and let it create a thread. Now, part of the difficulty in this is that this thread is something that has to be visible to the hardware. Like, the hardware has to know about OS-level threads, and this thread number 674 is not going to be something that's deterministic. So what we can do is, in the RSM, we can trap control of the of the fork call before it returns, and we can include this thread within our replay sphere, and then give it a uh, an R thread ID deterministically. So now we can we can guarantee that this individual thread has the exact same ID that it had before. Now, one one more subtle issue that I want to talk about are something that we found called implicit dependencies. So in this particular figure, we've got um, a replay sphere with two different R threads, and they're sharing the same page table. So one of the things that we found that, that could happen is if you have one thread that issues an mProtect system call, what this is going to do is it's going to cause a modification of the page table. And at some point later in time, the second CPU is going is to see this modification, and it's going to affect how this software runs. Namely, it's going to cause a segmentation fault. Now, one of the difficulties is that we have to guarantee that it happens at the exact loop iteration, uh, or else the replay isn't deterministic. And so what you can see what's happening here is, in effect, we've got a dependency that's being formed between these two threads in a way that's not direct. Loads and stores we know how to handle, but this type of, this type of dependency is, uh, is something that has to be deterministic. So our solution is similar to the, other, to the previous solution where we use the underlying hardware to, to uh, track these dependencies for us. 
So the operating system has to know about these types of address space manipulations and it expresses this implicit dependency to the hardware explicitly. So that way the hardware can make sure that it can track any of these types of interactions. Um, so we built the Capo One system using um, modified DeLorean hardware that we simulated in Simix. We modified the Ubuntu 7.10 operating system, which is a 2.6 version of the Linux kernel. Um, we have a user mode replay sphere manager portion that interacts with a kernel mode replay sphere portion, and we record and replay Linux processes. So one slide that, that Joseph didn't show you in the first part was the, what the DeLorean hardware looked like for, their, for the ISCA paper. So one thing I'd like to point out is that there's a, an interrupt log, an I.O. log, and all these different entities for recording any of the things you might see on a computer system. So what we found is by pushing some of the complexity up to the software, we're able to make the, the hardware simpler. So now there are fewer things that the hardware has to worry about, and it can just focus on, on what it does best, and then you know, push some of this complexity up into the software. Now, yeah, Ed? How do you handle signal delivery after a stable interrupt? Um, how do we handle signal delivery? After a stable interrupt. So, so, so we pull the same trick that, that many different people play, where, such as yourself, where we just deliver them at system call boundaries. So we took a page out of your playbook. Um, however, you know, this, is a, this is a problem that actually we could solve quite well with DeLorean. So the problem that Ed's pointing out is that we have an asynchronous event that happens at a, at a, at a place in the, in the middle of the instruction stream. And you know, these in an operating system are signals. So to simplify our implementation, we push signal delivery for asynchronous signals to system call boundaries. Um, it's still within the semantics of Unix signals, but you know, it's a trick that other people have played. The right way of doing this is to have ways to identify the precise place in the instruction stream to deliver the signal. So x86 performance counters are one way of doing this, but the DeLorean hardware provides a very nice second way of doing this because we know how many chunks have executed. This is a fundamental part of the system. So in order to evaluate uh, Capo, we use two different environments. We use a simulation environment that has simulated DeLorean hardware and a full-blown operating system, and it's simulating a, a four-way uh, SMP system. And we also have a real hardware configuration that obviously doesn't include DeLorean hardware, but it gives us an idea of how much overhead the software is going to add. So in this figure, I have the log size that, that we create as a result of our, uh, of our system. So on the y-axis, we have log size expressed in, in bits per kilo instruction. And on the x-axis, we have the three different benchmarks we ran. Uh, Splash 2, which is a traditional parallel benchmark. Apache, which is a, a web server that we had some web performance numbers running on it. And then Make, where we compile the kernel. Now, one of the interesting results from this particular, or there are two interesting results from this particular uh, set of evaluation. So first, in many respects, it was a validation of the DeLorean design because what we found are that the hardware level log sizes were roughly equivalent to, to what they were in the full system case. Now the reason this is interesting is because when you integrate with software, there are more opportunities to, to cut these chunks short. You know, page faults and exceptions and all these different things could potentially cut chunks short. And what we found is that in the common case, the, these don't occur often enough to affect our log size. Now the second interesting result was that the software portion, which is shown up here in yellow, is much smaller than the hardware portion of the log. So we were planning on doing a number of different optimizations to, to decrease log size, but what we found is that we didn't have to. Because everything's being dominated by the hardware, that simplified our software implementation as well. Now, in this graph, what I have shown here is the performance overhead um, during, during logging of our replay system. So on the left, we have the uh, normalized run time, where it's all normalized to one, and uh, anything higher is slower, so higher is bad. Um, and we break down the performance by interposition layer and then everything else. So one of the interesting things we found here was that we made a very early design decision to use ptrace to, to prototype our system. 
So, you know, I've developed a rant in my class about Ptrace based on this experience where, you know, it gives you the allure of user mode code. Oh, great, I can implement the RSM in user mode. It's going to be great and everything's going to be so simple. And your first implementation is. But the problem is it's really, really slow. Slower than you would ever guess. And so now you're stuck with an implementation that works and you've got to make it fast. So you start shoehorning implementation, uh, optimizations into the kernel and it gets to a point where the optimizations to make the ptrace performance bearable end up being much more complex than if we had just implemented it inside the operating system to begin with. So in hindsight, you know, I guess the big lesson learned here is they're twofold. So first is, you know, the performance is, is really going to be uh, small and it's going to be even smaller. So I would say with a kernel-based implementation, around 20% overhead for, for a kernel make um, is, is about what we expect. But another lesson is don't use ptrace. So, you know, resist temptation. Now finally, um, the last result I want to show is replay performance. So on the y-axis here, we have uh, normalized runtime. And shown here, we have the, the replay performance of three different benchmarks. We have Apache serving 1K pages, Apache serving 10K pages, and Apache serving 100K pages. So in this particular case, lower is better. So that means that we're, if, you're, if you're lower than one, that means we're able to replay faster than when we logged. And this particular set of results are interesting for a couple of reasons. So one is we can replay a lot faster than, than we logged. And you know, this is very related to a concept called idle time compression that was discovered by other researchers. Um, we had a slightly different take on it where uh, our compression was coming from the network. But the, the key idea is that by emulating these actions instead of actually carrying them out, things go much faster. So to me, the implication here is if we do implement hardware support for replay, obviously the replay speed needs to be in, uh, fast. The faster you make replay speed, the better. But what these results seem to indicate is that we might have a little more design slack on replay performance than we have on logging overhead. And so if we have a potential trade-off we could make, you know, it might be better to optimize for log logging performance, uh, re recording performance as opposed to replay performance. Yeah? Uh, can you start replay in the middle of an execution before you have to start from the beginning? Um, so the question is, can you start um, in the middle of execution? And really, this is a... a not something that we covered explicitly in this research, but other people have looked at this. So the key idea is, you know, we've got these deterministic replay logs where you can recreate past states. But that's only one version of time travel. Something like checkpointing, when combined with replay, makes a very powerful combination. So if you wanted to replay from the middle, you would take checkpoints as you're going. You'd roll back to a previous checkpoint and start from there. Uh, we didn't do it with this project because uh, other people, well, I, I've looked at this in the past with, with some of my colleagues from Michigan. No. You, should, you should be able to add checkpointing with no, uh, with no problem. Yes, so you know, the, the amount of state added from the replay hardware is relatively small. Uh, using off-the-shelf techniques should, should work effectively. So the conclusions are, um, you know, in the first part of the talk, what we showed was a very clever and very efficient way of recording thread interleavings. Um, this provides some hardware support for doing something that's just very difficult to do in software. Now, what we did is we took this very clever mechanism and included it within an overall replay system. And one of the things we found is that there are some very subtle and fundamental interactions that happen when you combine these two things. And what we presented was CAPA1, which is a, an overall replay system that includes both the, the hardware and software components. And that is the end of my talk. Um, are there any questions? I'm actually going to skip additional research from my group, uh, uh, mainly in the interest of time. But uh, it's profound, let me tell you. <laughs> so are there any, uh, any final questions? Great. Well, thank you all for, for having us.